All right. Um, well, thank all, almost none of you for coming. <laughs> and uh, I hope someone will actually watch this somewhere. Yeah. Um, okay, so there's, there were some things left over from before that I could talk about, but um, I'm going to skip, skip to the new material about knowledge. Um, so the first thing Locke says about knowledge is that all our knowledge is about ideas. And so um, all our knowledge is only conversant about ideas. Um, and then the second thing he says about our knowledge is that the way it's conversant about our ideas is only these two things. Knowledge seems to be, to me to be nothing but the perception of the connection and agreement or disagreement and repugnancy of any of our ideas. I mean, actually, you might think there were four things there, like agreement and connection disagreement and repugnancy, but he doesn't seem to make a distinction like that in what comes afterwards. So I think there's just two things. Um, so at first from this, it sounds like, um, it sounds like there's, like this entails two things. One is gonna be, that in Kant's terminology, all our knowledge is analytic. Um, right? In Kant's terminology, an analytic judgment is one where you can see, at least a categorical analytic judgment, is one where you can see that the subject and predicate agree with each other just by examining the concepts, um, which um, at least you might think that that idea could be translated as concept here. And in fact, it's interesting, I, the, the early German translation, in fact, does translate idea as begriff. Um, I don't, but I don't know if Kant read it in German or French or Latin or what. Um, but so in any case, um, um, so you might think that Locke is saying that all our knowledge has to be like that that it all has to be, um, what's an example of that according to Kant? Um, all bodies are extended. It's something that, so to speak, is true by definition. Um, so um, that's one thing you might think this implies. And the other thing you might think this implies is Subjective idealism, um, all our knowledge is about our own ideas, whether they agree or disagree with each other. It can't possibly be about anything else. I mean, that's what he said. Our knowledge is conversant only about our ideas. So if I say, um, I know there's a table there, either I'm wrong or I'm talking about my ideas. <laughs> um, now, I mean, we'll see that Barclay, um, well, I mean, Barclay is famous as the person who holds subjective idealism in the sense I just gave. The truth is that even Barclay, there's a kind of exception to that, a kind of weird exception to that. But, um, but uh, Locke actually doesn't want to claim either one of these. So, one of the things we have to try to figure out is how it is that even though all our knowledge is about agreement and disagreement of our ideas, according to Locke, we know various non-trivial things about external objects, things that are not ideas. 
Um, and for that matter, about internal objects, because uh, remember, I emphasized to begin with that, um, as I, that on the best reading of Locke is that I can figure out when he talks about uh, reflection, the ideas of reflection are not the same as the operations of our mind that are the objects of, that are the immediate objects of reflection. Um, so when I reflect on my own act of perception, here's my mind, there's, um, there's several things in my mind. There's an act of perception. This act of perception has an idea as its object, but that's not important. And then the act of perception gives rise to an idea in my mind, which I perceive in the act of reflection. So Locke wants to claim that we know various non-trivial things about things out here and um, operations of our mind in here. Um, how is that supposed to work? So that's, um, um, well, actually, I'm not going to talk about that later. I'm going to talk about that right now. <laughs> or at least I'm going to talk about, I'm going to start talking about the second one of these right now and then go back and talk about the first one. Um, um, although, I mean, really Locke talks about the two things together. So I'm going to have to go back and forth. But I'm going to start by talking about this one. So, um, so one response to this worry about subjective idealism is going to be that um, as long as my ideas function as archetypes for objects, there's no problem. Um, this is what he says in chapter four of book four on page 501. Um, Because real things are no further concerned nor intended to be meant by any such proposition than as things really agree to those archetypes in his mind. And the main examples he discusses this in the case of mathematics and morality. So here's an example. I have an idea in my mind of a triangle. And I want to ask, um, by knowing something about this idea, how can I possibly know anything about other things that are not my idea, like real triangles? So the answer is supposed to be that this idea of a triangle, maybe I should draw it inside this mind bubble. Here's the idea triangle. Now, I know various things about the idea triangle. But the idea triangle also is a kind of standard to which something outside of my mind might or might not match up. That's what it means by, that's what it means by saying it's the archetype. Right? It's the, um, um, it's the original copy to which the others are going to be compared to see if they match it or not. That's what archetype means. So there might be nothing out here that matches up to this archetype. That is, there might not be any triangles. But um, in that case, uh, even in that case, I have some real knowledge here, right? That is, I mean, what I know is, um, well, first of all, I know that if there were any real triangles, that the things, that certain things would have to be true of them. And if there aren't any true, any real triangles, then those things don't have to be true. So I know various things about the world outside my mind just by knowing about this idea because of this relationship it has to external objects that it's an archetype for them and they have to match up to them, to it. And he says the same thing about, um, um, this is basically an example of a simple mode, right? And he says the same thing about uh, the ideas of morality, which are the main examples always of complex modes, right? So in other words, if I think various things about um, injustice, 
Um, and it turns out there isn't really any injustice in the world because, for example, there, no one has any property or something like that. Then uh, the things that I thought about injustice weren't wrong. It's just that nothing happens to match up to that I archetype, that idea of injustice that I had in my mind. Um, now, um, there's, there's two problems with this answer. One, that Locke doesn't seem to raise, but that Hume is going to raise, and that Kant in some way, Kant's whole project is to try to answer it is, hold on a second, how did I so much get the, the notion, I don't want to say idea, because how did I so much get the notion of an agreement between this thing and something else? Actually, I guess I should say Barclay is already going to raise this. Barclay is going to say that it's absurd and there is no answer. <laughs> right? It is, to, to get the idea of agreement between two things, you would think I would have to consider the two things and see if they agree with each other, or at least be able to, right? In other words, if I think this is something to which something else might match up, you would think that it might be at least possible for me to compare it to that thing and see if it does match up. But Locke is saying, no, we, ne we never can. All our knowledge is about our ideas. Um, uh, so that's one problem. Um, you know, uh, whether that's a fatal problem with that, this, or not, is kind of hard to say. I mean, this is an assumption, as I, as I emphasize in 100b, this is as all the rationalists basically assume that we understand this idea object relation. Um, and are they wrong? But as for you know, Descartes right away assumes that I know what it is to ask whether the ideas that I have in my mind represent something like that ex externally to me or not. Um, so I mean, so Locke isn't assuming any more than those guys do. And the question is, are they all misguided? So, I mean, so Barclay and Hume and Kant think, yes, they're all misguided to assume they understand this idea-object relation. Um, uh, but may, maybe there's something to be said for, um, for the other side in that respect. It's not that important. Well, I mean, it is really important, but it's not that important to discuss it further now <laughs> because even by Locke's own life, there's, there's, there's a this kind of knowledge won't take us very far. And the reason is because um, um, it won't get us any knowledge of substances. Because Locke says the idea of a substance is supposed to be not the archetype, but the ectype, right? That it's, it's the, the substance is supposed to be the archetype. The idea of a substance is supposed to be the idea of some properties that really do go together somewhere. Isn't, um, yeah. Isn't the perception of those things what you're comparing to the I like the ideas that arise from the perception of those things, those substances, isn't that what you're comparing to the idea? that, you know, comes about in your, from reflection only? Um, well, okay, so the idea that comes about by reflection, I mean, maybe this, this diagram has gotten confusing, but. Like that, like that triangle. That yeah, the triangle is not an idea of reflection. Where does that idea come from? Well, um. Isn't it? No, <laughs> it's not innate, but it's a simple mode. And so, I mean... Um, Would a simple mode also be common sense and imagination? Well, I mean, I guess you could say it's common sense and imagination, but it's in a very specific way. So, right, so, so I guess the point is, you might think I could not possibly have the idea of a triangle unless a triangle actually affected me one time. Exactly. You know, so, um, but that's not the case because the mind has the ability to form modes out of simple ideas. 
So all I have to have is the simple ideas. Right? Remember, Locke says that the mind finds that it can add its pieces of extension together at any angle it wants. So it just gets the simple idea of extension and maybe a couple others that are involved in that. I don't know if angle is a different simple idea or whatever. And then it finds that it can compose them into these simple modes. And triangle is one of them. So I can have the, so I, I can have the idea of triangle even though no triangle has ever affected me. So, um, but, um, um, but the claim is that um, um, I can't I can't have the idea of gold as a substance if no gold has ever affected me. Um, because the idea of a substance, again, is, it's, well, so it's supposed to be, I think if Locke were being careful, he might say, um, but maybe I'm, maybe I'm too much taking Leibniz aside by saying that he would have to do this if he was being careful. But he might say, look, the idea of gold as a substance is the idea that the following properties possibly go together yellow, fusible, which means that it melts, um, malleable, etc. So um, how do I know that they possibly go together? Um, and the answer is, at least in most cases, according to Locke, I can only know that because I perceive them together. Um, so I can't form the idea of a substance in my mind and say, well, maybe something measures up to this idea and maybe it doesn't. I, I mean, it's, it's weird because apparently the same complex idea could have, I could have made a complex mode out of the same simple ideas. I mean, I don't think he ever talks about a case like this, but it seems like I could have made a complex mode over, out of the exact same ideas that I, instead I've made an idea of a substance out of. So I could have made the, the you know, the property of um, yellowness and fusibility and whatever. And then that would be the archetype. And I would say, well, whatever has this pr the property is yellow or, you know, something. And I would be right, even though if there's nothing actually has that, those combination of properties. But the idea of substance is supposed to claim more that these properties might really go together. And I can only know that if they really do go together. Yeah. Did you have a question? Yeah. Um, you had mentioned yellow. You had, uh, I thought I heard that you were talking about particulars or a attributes, the, the yellowness and the, the yeah. ability of gold to fuse down, melt down. And then you said, I thought you were making the correlation with yellow and the triangle. My question is, can you take an attribute in, in the mind and conceptualize the idea that you conceptualize an idea? I mean, because you have all these attributes, you know, particulars of gold itself, but you haven't seen gold, so would you be able to, I mean, of course he said you can't fathom the idea, although it's formed in the mind as a simple mode. Well, okay. So the mode I was just talking about now would be a complex mode. That it's, or a mixed mode? Sorry, mixed mode. Right? I'm using the wrong term. The mode I'm just talking about now would be a mixed mode, right? Because it contains a color and, a, and some passive powers and other stuff. Uh, it's not a simple mode. Um, but he does say the mind can put together those simple ideas however it wants. So, yeah, I'm free to form in my mind the idea of a chimera or, you know, of a substance that's yellow and fusible and as hard as gold, but lighter than water, or, or you know, anything like that, right? I can form these complex, but, but, um, um, but the claim is that if I, if I mean that as an idea of a substance, I don't know that, um, 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 I don't know that I really have an idea of a substance unless such a substance is at least possible. 
other, otherwise, I know all I know is that I've thought about some property that something might have, but not that I'm talking about substances. Um, May I ask another question? Yeah. About simple modes. Yes. And how how is it that the mind learns to like put them together? Is it is it like how does the mind learn to compare them? Well, uh, I think he thinks the mind, the human mind, has an innate tendency to do this. Right? He says we start doing it. And remember, he believes in he doesn't believe in innate principles or innate ideas, but he does believe in innate tendencies. As soon, almost as soon as any ideas enter our mind, I think he says somewhere we start this process of distinguishing them and comparing them. Isn't that a concept, though? Is what a concept? Like, isn't that the mind applying a concept? So it seems like it'd be an innate con like. Well, okay, so cons and, you know, he barely ever uses the term concept. Um, but, you know, but he distinguishes between, between ideas in the mind, operations of the mind with respect to the ideas, and the powers of the mind or faculties to perform those operations. Or I guess, I mean, there's, that is, there's active powers to perform those operations, and there's passive powers to get the ideas from something. Um, so he distinguishes all those things, um, and he says that some of them are innate and others aren't. <laughs> and so if you want to call some of those things concepts, then he thinks that there are innate concepts, even though he doesn't think they're innate ideas. Yes. I mean, as I said, it's complicated because in the German, and at least the early German translation that I looked at, and I think it's the only Actually, I'm not even sure this is true. I think it's the only early German translation that uh, that they did choose, translator did choose to translate idea as big rift, which is the usual word for concept. That's the word in con, for example, that's translated as concept. Um, but just thinking about Locke by himself, I don't, it's hard to get him started on the debate about concepts because he doesn't, that's not one of his usual terms. Did you have a question? I was just wondering, how can you say we have a, the mind has innate qualities, but then it's also a blank slate? Well, um, a blank slate has innate qualities, it just doesn't have any writing on it. <laughs> right? I mean, to say something is a blank slate is not to say that it doesn't exist. It's just to say that something hasn't been done to it yet. I Has guess, it? but it seems like you, you're saying there's certain operations that the mind performs innately. No, no, he says it has the power and even the tendency to perform them innately, but not that it does perform them innately. I, I, right, this, to say that the mind performs these operations innately would mean that when we're born, we're performing them already. Locke thinks that's just not true. Um, I mean, it's true that perception, we do perform the operation of perception almost right away, or maybe a little bit in the womb. That's not really, you know, I mean, that's uh, the question of where it starts isn't that important. Locke discusses, I didn't really assign that part, but he basically says it's not that important. <laughs> right? So, um, um, but it's not, um, but it still it requires something else to get it started. Right, something has to act on the mind first, and then that calls forth that operation. We don't start, begin by carrying out the operation, and neither the mind starts with a property of, of receiving ideas, but it hasn't received any to begin with, and that's why it's like a blank slate. So a blank, right, a blank slate has, so to speak, an innate capacity to receive writing. It just hasn't received any yet. Um, um, so yeah, I mean, I think that metaphor is actually can go pretty far with what it means. Does that metaphor uh, relate to the first prompt where you talk about the furnished and empty cabinet? Uh, probably. I mean, the, the cabinet metaphor is similar, right? I mean, the cabinet doesn't innately have anything in it, but it is innately a cabinet. <laughs> I guess. It, I think a cabinet is kind of like a room or something. I don't think it's a, what we call a cabinet, but I'm not sure. 
Because you wouldn't, we wouldn't really furnish it. That's what the prompt said, and, and furnish. Yeah, no, no, I mean, that's well, quoting him. I, I just, I think cabinet has changed its meaning a little bit. I, it's not important, but anyway, and the point is, it already has walls and a floor and a ceiling. It just hasn't done that in furniture. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, so, I mean, I guess the answer to both these questions goes the same direction, right? That is, if you say, wait, I thought he didn't believe there was anything innate in the mind. No, he's really specific about what he thinks is not innate in the mind, ideas, and therefore principles. Because principles require, or, or judgments in general, require ideas. Um, <coughs> um, it's true, and I'm going to talk about it in a second, maybe, that, um, or at least allude to it, that. Kant is going to say that the, the capacity the mind starts out with to do these things means that it has some um, um, not innate but pure a priori concepts which are of the same kind as the concept of a substance like gold. So given the change in terminology, it's hard to say exactly, but, it, but it, I think Kant is, dis, is, is disagreeing with Locke about something there, but it's not as easy as it might seem at first sight to put your finger on what they're disagreeing about. <laughs> I mean, what Kant calls a pure a priori concept is actually pretty similar to what Locke calls an innate tendency. Um, and it's more similar to that than it is to what Locke calls an innate idea. So what they're disagreeing about is something a little bit more subtle than that. Um, but um, um, so um, so that Locke's answer to this part of the problem is kind of the same as the problem, right? That is, I said, the problem is, well, how do I know if I have ideas of substances? Because I, I don't, I, for it to be the idea of a substance, it has to be the idea of the properties possibly coming together. And how would I know that if I haven't perceived them? And Locke's answer is, well, but if you have perceived them, you do know that they possibly go together. And that's how far your ideas of substances go. So that is, this, this depends on Locke's view about um, what our abstract ideas of substance, our ideas of, of types of substance, are like. Um, according to Leibniz, at least if we, had, if we had the kind of idea we should have of substances, um, it would be something from which the possibility of the sensible properties going together could be deduced. So it would be a real essence. So knowing the real essence of gold, we would be able to figure out from that that um, since there's no, since this is a possible real essence, which we could know somehow, then we would say, and anything that has this real essence would be capable of producing these sense impressions. And therefore, I know that it's possible for something to be yellow and blah, blah, blah. Um, but, um, but, and if that were true, then, um, although when I, let's say I observe yellowness and fusibility, I mean, you know, fusibility, as Bach will admit, is not exactly a simple idea. It's a power, it's a passive faculty of being melted. And in fact, it really means at being melted at a low enough temperature. I don't think they knew this. I think they thought that some metals would never melt and others would. So the ones that will melt are called fusible and the ones that never melt are not fusible. But in fact, it's really just that the ones that they didn't call fusible melt at a higher temperature that they couldn't achieve. <laughs> all metals melt if you get them hot enough. Um, all right, but never mind that. So uh, um, as, as Locke suggests, think of fusible as if it were a simple idea like yellow. 
So now, um, um, suppose I, I perceive yellowness and fusibility and malleability together and solubility in aqua regia. Um, and uh, I form the idea of a substance that has those properties. So if I mean that to be the particular idea of that particular substance, then everything's okay according to Leibniz or Locke. Right, because I have actually, I mean, that is given that we've somehow taken care of that other word, so that I can somehow think of something external to me having the power to, pr to produce something that agrees with it inside of me. Um, now I know that since I had these perceptions together, whatever that thing is has the power to produce those perceptions together. So there is a particular substance that has those secondary qualities, namely the power to produce just those perceptions. But if I wanted to conclude from that, according to Leibniz, if I wanted to include from that that there's a species of substance in which just those things go together, I don't really have any grounds for saying that yet. I don't know why those perceptions came together. I don't know the real essence from which they're deduced. And so, um, um, I don't know whether just that same real essence, um, um, will ever produce those perceptions together again. <laughs> um, and you know, this is what Locke, Locke says that this type of idea of sorts of substance would be useless because um, since we don't know what the real essence is, there's no reason to think that that real essence that, pro that produced yellowness and whatever, whatever in that piece of gold isn't also in this table. It's just here it's producing something else. Um, so if you're in 100B, which out of the <laughs> two people who are near now, you, were you in 100B? No, <laughs> half were and half were. Uh, <laughs> uh, you were, yeah. Well, so I mean, <laughs> if, you're, um, if you're in 100B, you remember that this feature of the occultness of substantial form is really important for the uses that some people put to it. Um, Right, like it's really important that the very same real essence that I don't know that was present in the body of Christ is present in this wafer. It's just not producing those sensible ideas now, at least by a miracle, that's possible. And if you remember what I said about the, the origin, the, why British philosophy is the way it is, um, at the beginning of the course, I hope it's now, it's like a little bit at least more plausible that issues about the Eucharist are not just like, um, I don't know, that they're more central than you might think. One of, the, one, one of the things Locke wants to point out is that that idea of substance that, it, that could explain the Eucharist is a terrible type of idea of substance. <laughs> um, so, but if you use his idea of substance, then it's right to say what he says on page 504. Whatever simple ideas have been found to coexist in any substance, these we may with confidence join together again, and so make abstract ideas of substances. Forever we have, forever, for whatever have once had an union in nature may be united again. And this is because by the substance, by the, the possibility that makes up the idea of the substance, all we need is the possibility of these ideas coming together, and we know that's possible. So we don't have to know anything about why. I'm not sure I explained that that well but that's the best I can do. All right. <laughs> um, are there questions about that from... <laughs> are there questions about that from whoever might eventually watch this on YouTube? So is the importance of that just that, um, that it represents something real? What? Which part? The, that the um, defining substance in this way, like or, I don't know, encountering substance is when you encounter something real? Uh, or, yeah, but they, I mean, I guess the question is... Or not real, but, you know, an external object that exists. I mean, all right, let, let me try to put it a little bit better than I did before. So the, the issue is, um, 
whether I can have knowledge about substances based on the way I get my ideas of substances. Um, and in particular, whether I can have general knowledge about substances. So if, so, um, so I can't get my ideas of substances just by putting simple ideas together because I don't know whether I've combined them in a possible way or not. Right. Possible, so, well, possible uh, being like actually exists. No, possible means possible, but then we're going to ask what that means. Why, what, what makes, how do I know it's possible? Yeah. Well, <laughs> why, is that, why, is that, why is that different from a triangle? Um, well, um, it's different from a triangle because um, when I put the ideas together in the triangle, I'm not saying that there possibly is a triangle. I'm just saying that I put these ideas together, and if someone, if something out there matches up to them, then what I'm thinking is true of it. But if I put the ideas together, if I were thinking triangular substance, kind of substance that's always triangular. Which, I mean, that may seem silly, but remember, like, we think about humans as a kind of substance that always has roughly this shape, mm -hmm. right? So if I thought of a kind of substance that's always triangular, now I don't know if I'm thinking of something possible or not. And so I, I don't know if I have a real idea of a substance or not. And in particular, if I form some knowledge based on that, um, um, it doesn't have any connection with things, it doesn't necessarily have any connection with things outside of me. Okay. I still think I'm not explaining that so well. Um, but so the point is, um, um, and according to Leibniz, so, so, so the solution to this is supposed to be, well, but in the case where the substance, there was actually a particular substance that affected me in a certain way and made these properties be together in me. These simple ideas come together. So now I know that they possibly go together. And now if I think, um, well, um, this type of substance always does this. At least I'm thinking something real. I might be wrong. <laughs> But at least you can see how I could have that kind of knowledge about substances because I now know that there is such a kind of substance to think about. It's that, it's, so this, this is really a problem about abstract ideas of substance. And about, that is about general ideas of substance. And, so, and the point is, according to Leibniz, that won't work because even though, yes, I knew, I know there was a real essence that was capable of producing these ideas together, um, Thinking of it that way, as producing these ideas together, is not thinking about what made it possible. So I think all such substances, blah, 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 I'm not really thinking about the real type of substance that caused this. So I'm not th thinking about the real sorts of substances in nature. So my general knowledge is about, not about real sorts of things. Whereas, according to Leibniz, since all I was thinking anyway was just something caused these properties to come together, but you're thinking about them in terms of just being a collection of simple ideas. Right. So whenever those simple ideas come together, never mind whether what produced them out here was completely different, by definition, I have another example of that substance. Now, again, I have an archetype which things can match up to or not match up to. Right, so that's, that was the point of that passage I was reading on page 504. Whatever simple ideas have been found to coexist in any substance, these we may with confidence join together again, and so make abstract ideas of substances. For whatever have once had an union in nature may be united again. Right, what's had a union in nature is just things that produce these simple ideas. <laughs> um. Um, well, okay, that's the end of what I wanted to say about that, and then the question is whether 
given that there's almost no one left, uh, whether I should just uh, stop here. I mean, I, it's, I feel weird giving a lecture just to you and Hav. <laughs> Especially because Hav seems <laughs> texting or something. No, no, I mean, that's fine. Oh, okay. Um, uh, well, um, whatever you want to do. Maybe I should just talk about a little bit of this at the beginning tomorrow. Hmm. Because, you know, like based on my past experience, not a lot of people watch these videos anyway. I think probably a few people were planning to watch it. But. I do have a question. You might have already yeah. addressed it in some way about this discussion concerning substance. That, <clears throat> is it the term substance itself just in being called substance, even if there's an immediate experience of something that one might call substance. Isn't that already a general term for an abstract idea every single time? And the reason I'm, I'm saying this is because, um, because of the different the experience of qualities. Because according to Locke, we experience secondary qualities always. Uh, if we're experiencing anything, uh, in terms of our, our sense perception, it's always going to be the secondary qualities from which the primary qualities are suggested. Hence, I guess this is my understanding of why substance is always a confused idea to begin with. It seems to be always suggested, but not something that is, is within the immediate grasp of, of perception. Well, it's, it's, am I making sense? Um, and so to even say, uh, here's yeah. a particular substance right now, immediately. You know, there's it 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 almost already, the, yeah. you say substance already sounds like a general yeah. term. So remember, Locke said to begin with that we have no idea of substance. Right. Because you could that, right? Uh, no, I think he said pretty explicitly that we have no idea of substance uh, as such. Remember, he said that it's one idea that would be great if it were innate because we can't possibly get it right. from perception or reflection, namely the idea of substance, but it's not innate, and so we don't have it. <laughs> now, I mean... But he does say there's a confused idea. It's the only one he calls a confused idea. There always will be a confused idea. Yeah, it's a confused idea of something we know not what. Right. Um, um, that's the, uh, so you're not the same. Okay. Yeah. So, but we do have we do have ideas of sorts of substance. Um, all those vague ideas. Well, no. I mean, they they sometimes they're vague, but uh, they don't have to be vague. Um, it seems like that's just a that's just a representation of the simple idea, the collection of simple ideas again. Like to say this is gold is basically like compounding, you know, the list of properties that is gold. No, but I see. But I mean, I think now we see what the real difference between these ideas of substances and the ideas of complex modes is, right? The ideas of complex modes, we don't have to ever perceive anything that matches them. Mm -hmm. The ideas of substances, um, um, so. We're thinking, this is the part that we don't really understand, right? We're thinking these things all came together because they were all in the same subject. The same possibility, fundamental possibility, gave rise to all of them or something like that. We don't really know what that thing is. And it's not right to say that it's the primary qualities either. Right? That's, that's, that's what's important. Right? That is, when we, talk, when we say we don't know what substance is, it means abstracting from everything, including the primary qualities. And then you're supposed to be left with the idea of substance, and Locke says, we don't know what that is. But, um, um, but we do know what it is for one of our, our complex ideas to be an idea of substance. Um, and it, those, we like, we like those ideas, we make those ideas. Um, 
I guess you'd say partly in the confused belief that we actually know what a substance is, but um, um, but there's still, I mean, clear that up, and there's still a really useful kind of idea to have. I think is what Locke is saying. Um, I think. This sounds. This so, yeah, so I, so I think it's consistent for him to say both, on the one hand, that we don't know what substance means, per se, and, but on the other hand, that we do have certain ideas that are rightly called ideas of types of substance, general ideas of substance, and, and, and particular ideas of particular substances. Um, it's just, it would be wrong to think that the way we sort those ideas out from the other ones is by noticing that they all have this idea of substance that they all have in common, because there is no such idea. Um, all right. Um, well, this is the time when even if I were going to continue, there would be a break. So maybe I'll turn the camera off and we could discuss whether we'll come back after the break or not. So the compromise is I'm going to say a few more things, but not go really towards the end. Um, so, because so far I've only got to like the first two sentences of book four. <laughs> I mean, I quoted a little bit from later on, but um, the important thing that happens right after that, which has more to do with this part, is that he explains that there's four different respects in which we can compare our ideas to see if they agree or disagree. Right, and these are called, uh, Locke calls these, um, identity and diversity, relation, um, coexistence, And I think the last one's called real existence, or what is it called? Um, yeah, real existence. Um, 
But, you know, as he says, these are really all just different kinds of relations. The term relation is a little strange here. When he, gets, when he goes to explain his terminology, he says, actually, it's strange. He says that these two are examples of relations. He doesn't mention this one when he says this, but he says these are just particular types of relations, but they're such distinctive, interesting relations that they're worth talking about separately. Now, I mean, that makes it sound like this classification is kind of um, a matter of convenience. Um, on the other hand, if you come to this from Kant, or for that matter, even from Leibniz, um, these four things look really familiar. Um, and it seems like we're really are like, um, calling them all, it's, it's calling them all relations, which would be kind of misleading, actually. They're so different from each other. Um, and just, I mean, at least for people, who are interested in correlating these with the traditional categories that, that Leibniz still thinks are good. In fact, Leibniz says that, that he still thinks these are good categories in his book, New Essays on Human Understanding, which is a response to, to this book by Locke. Um, so at one point, because Locke gives category as an example of the abuse of words, of a word that people have used that they didn't mean anything by. <laughs> and Leibniz says, well, actually, I think that, you know, some of the categories are really important. And, and says, particularly these four, quantity, quality, um, substance, and action and passion, I think, the, is how he says the fourth one. Well, um, um, and that list of four qualities comes from Plotinus, of course, four categories comes from Plotinus, actually, but never mind that. Um, so quantity and quality, I mean, definitely appear here. Identity and diversity is numerical difference applied to our ideas, right? So this is what Locke says, anytime we have two ideas, we can't help by noticing that they're diverse. Namely, they're not the same idea. <laughs> um, um, now, I mean, he also talks about identity and diversity of various other things, as we saw before, like people and so forth. But, uh, but here when he's talking about the ways, the four ways we can compare our ideas, I think we're talking about identity of, and diversity of ideas. And that's why he says, this one is immediate and there can never be any doubt about it and whatever, because this is just, um, if you can't tell whether you're having one idea or two ideas, then you're not really thinking at all, <laughs> right? But it's as soon, the first operation of the mind after perception is distinguishing your distinction or whatever you call it. Um, so that's identity, so that's difference in quantity. Um, and that helps explain what relation means. Relation is difference in quality. Now, I mean, that's, Locke doesn't use the term quality in explaining it exactly, but, um, but the way he does explain it is um, by saying uh, that we can have two things that we know are different from each other, and yet we can now compare them and see that they're similar in, in some ways and not in others. And that's basically what quality, in a broad sense of the term, means. The way in which things that numeric are numerically different could be the same or, or not the same is what quality is. Um, so, um, in this, is basically all about substance. Right, that is when Locke goes to explain what comparing our ideas with respect to coexistence, or another phrase he uses for this coexistence is necessary connection, which we'll see is a very important phrase in Hume. Um, this, this idea of coexistence or necessary connection is the idea of properties being together in the same subject, that is, in a substance. So
So it's when we uh, think of our ideas as ideas of substances in particular that we're comparing them this way. And the last one, um, and so by the way, um, it's not surprising then, especially what I just said about the term necessary connection. So we'll see in Hume, when people think about necessary connection, they mostly think about Hume's argument about causation, right? That Hume says that necessary connection between distinct things is unintelligible and therefore that the idea of causation doesn't make sense or something like that. Um, now, so, I mean, I guess this kind of works both ways. On the one hand, um, um, it's clear if Hume is thinking about Locke that he knows that it's not just causation but substance also is involved in the criticism of necessary connection. Um, and on the other hand, I think it's clear why um, Kant, um, when he discusses his four categories, of which the first two are quanti quantity and quality again, when he gets to this one, he combines substance and cause and effect. Substance and accident and cause and effect and something else, which is um, community, but never mind that. <laughs> so, um, uh, so, and therefore he doesn't call this category substance as Leibniz does, he calls it confusingly relation. Right, that is the same term that Locke used up here, Kant is going to use down here. Um, and so, and finally, real existence. Well, so this is basically, it does make sense to connect this with Leibniz's final category of action and passion. This, by the way, is not the order that Leibniz has. This is, but this is Locke's order and Kant's order. Um, um, right, because according to Locke, to compare my idea with real existence is about, com about the comparison between my idea and something really corresponding to them. And that basically is a matter of um, thinking of the external thing acting on me and me passively receiving the idea. Um, I mean, and that's exactly the way Leibniz wants to use this category also. Right? That is, as far as Leibniz is concerned, action and passion is all about clear representation of, of some other substance outside. Um, so, Kant calls this category modality. And, but it turns out to really be the same thing. When we say something is possible, we're talking about powers um, that somehow or other we know external things have. And we say that it's actual, we're saying that it acted on me and that it affected my passive faculty of sense. Um, so, well, so just that is interesting, at least to me. The same four categories that come from Plotinus, Leibniz, Locke, and Kant basically agree on, even though they call them different things. And even though Locke says the word category doesn't even mean anything. <laughs> um, um, but the other thing I want to talk about in this connection is the two examples that Leibniz gives right away when he talks about um, how we compare our ideas for agreement and disagreement. And one is white and black. And the other is um, sum of angles of a triangle. This is, so here's idea number one and idea number two, white and, white and black. Idea number one or idea number two, sum of angles of a triangle 
and sum of two right angles. So, I mean, first of all, white and black we would normally think of as qualities. So you might think that this goes with this, but not according to Locke. Right? According to Locke, the way I know that white is not black is that they're different ideas. And that's the end of the story. <laughs> um, um, so it's numerical diversity of ideas. On the other hand, here, um, and I mean, this is not just a guess. When, when Locke goes on to discuss each one of these separately, he comes back to this example when he talks about this. Right? So in other words, here he's agreeing. So, so this is supposed to be an example. This is an example of disagreement. Right? These are different ideas. And there are no examples of agreement in identity and diversity because identity has to mean it's the same idea twice. <laughs> so the examples would be white and white, which is not really an example. <laughs> right? And that's actually what Locke says. It says if we only had this way of comparing ideas, we would have no positive knowledge because all we would ever figure out is that all our ideas are not the same as each other. <laughs> positive knowledge comes in with this. Um, and so this is an example of positive knowledge. These two things agree with each other. The sum of the internal angles of a triangle and the sum of two right angles, that is what we would call 180 degrees, necessarily go together. But by putting it under here, Locke is agreeing, they go together even though these are not the same idea. They're different ideas, um, but they necessarily go together. So oh, I'm afraid I erased this, but if we think of the two problems we had here before, the first one was that it seemed all our knowledge would be analytic. Um, if analytic means that we, can, that we compare the ideas to see if they're the same or have some part that's the same, then Locke is agreeing that we don't do that here. We have a way of comparing two ideas and seeing that they necessarily agree with each other, um, even though they aren't the same idea. And I guess you have to add, they don't even share a common part. Um, so, um, so in other words, in Kant's terminology, Locke is more or less agreeing that this is synthetic. Um, and this is important. I hope you're not annoyed, either you or the people in video land, if I say something more about Kant. Uh, but it's important because one of the ways Kant criticizes Hume is to say that Hume thought he could just attack causation. He thought his attack on necessary connection of distinct ideas was an attack only on causation. He didn't realize that it was an attack on the other categories too. And Kant says if he had realized it was an attack on the other categories too, Hume's good sense would have saved him because he would have realized that he was saying mathematics was no good. So, I mean, this is always, it's, it's always seemed to me like an unfair accusation because for one thing, it seems clear that Hume, I mean, this is both a textual point and a, that is, it's always seemed like an unfair accusation and maybe an indication that Kant knew nothing about the context of the contents of the treatise, as people often say he did. Right? Because in the treatise, Kant, Hume talks a lot about substance. And moreover, he talks about mathematics and raises certain problems about mathematics in the treatise also. Um, but I think Kant is probably right to say that Hume doesn't think of this as an example of necessary connection of distinct ideas that's under attack. And that I don't know if he's right in the further claim that if Hume had thought of it that way, he would have stopped there. I, knowing Hume, I think he would have put, you know, barged right on the head. <laughs> but at least it gives more both plausibility to Kant's claim and maybe more indication that he might, after all, know more about what Hume said and still make this claim than people give him credit for. Anyway. Um, I wanted to say something about 
I think we can learn a lot, and this is going to be useful next time too, from see, from pointing out how Locke thinks this does work. So the way it works, um, um, how is it that we can see that these two ideas agree in some respect, even though they're not the same idea? So one way would be that in some respect they're identical or something like that. And I think that if that were the case, we would have what Locke calls intuitive knowledge of this agreement. So, um, um, so like, for example, if the, um, if the proposition were something like that if this angle is less than 90 degrees, then this one is greater. Um, then we can see that, th so these aren't the same idea, but we can see that this one has a part that's the same as this one in some respect, abstracting from the fact that they're facing in different directions. <laughs> And so we can see immediately just by looking at it that this has a part that's the same as this one and another part, so it's, it's bigger. Um, but Locke doesn't think that, um, and so, um, so this intuitive knowledge could rightly be called analytic. And Kant, by the way, like, agrees with this. The whole is greater than its parts is analytic. <laughs> um, so, um, um, but Hume doesn't think that, the, that, that this is like that. Um, in this case, we have what he calls demonstrative knowledge. And demonstrative knowledge means that to compare the two ideas, we have to put some other idea in between. And what's the other idea we put in between? Well, um, is, is this part of the board trial video? Not very well. Oh, well, so maybe I should erase some of this then. Does this part show? Yes. Okay. So suppose we have a triangle and we want to know, we want to know, we want to compare the sum of these three angles to two right angles. So um, Locke says we can't do it um, just by um, immediately comparing them because um, um, I can't find the exact quote, but he says it's basically because you can't put these three angles together in such a way as to compare them with two angles or one angles, one angle. <laughs> Right, um, that is, you have these two right angles and it's just a completely different shape than these three angles. And I think this goes together with, yeah. It's in paragraph nine. No, I mean section nine. Yeah, yeah whatever, paragraph, section. And then the, in the middle of the- Of chapter. Paragraph, chapter wait. one, book four, isn't it? Uh, maybe. The three angles of a triangle are equal to two right ones. One who has seen, yeah. Is that, is that the place where he says why we can't compare them directly, though? Um. It is by the intervention of the other idea than those which at first produced that perception. Well, uh, okay, never mind. I don't want to get bogged down on this. So, um, I mean, I think this goes together with something he says later in another place where he says, suppose I draw two triangles that aren't similar and I want to know um, whether they're equal or not. That is, whether they have the same area or not. And he says, I can't compare them directly because um, the difference in figure makes it impossible to match their parts up against each other. 
So I, I think he's thinking something similar is the problem here. So, have, so, so we have to put some other idea in between. And so the way we put the other idea in between is we draw a parallel to AB through C. And then we say, well, look, this angle is the same as this angle. And this angle, Locke doesn't say this, but I think he has a proof like this in mind. And Euclid's proof of this proposition is very similar to this. It's, it's a little bit different, but not in an important way. Um, and we know this angle is the same as this angle. And we know that these three have to add up to two right angles. Therefore, these three add up to two right angles. Right? So in other words, the, the idea that we've put in between the sum of these angles and the sum of two right angles is the sum of these angles. And these angles have the right shape to be compared to two right angles. They're all together pointing the same direction, so to speak. Um, now, um, well, I said I wasn't going to go the whole time. Now I'm almost going the whole time. <laughs> but, oh well. Uh, so, um, okay. Um, what about how do I know that this angle is the same as that? Well, I mean, that's just another word for what it is I know. Yeah, but how do I know that, right? So, um, that is, how do I know that when a line falls across two parallel lines, it makes equal alternating angles? Another mediating idea? So, you might think so, and in fact, in Euclid, so in Euclid, um, the theorem about the, um, the interior angles adding up to two right angles is, is book one, proposition 32 of the elements. At least it's, it's part of it. He proves a couple of, one other thing there too, but. Um, and it depends on two other propositions of the elements. And one is 129, which is the thing about alternating angles. And the other is 113, which is basically that if you have a bunch of angles that go from, go on the same straight line, that they have to add up to two right angles. I mean, actually, he says it, he proves it about two angles. Um, <laughs> how do I know that? I looked it up last night. <laughs> <laughs> No, I don't know if I. You're just like, no, I, okay. I, I'm allowed to prepare for class, aren't I? No, I mean, but I didn't know where to look. I mean, I know something. <laughs> uh, right. So, um, but I mean, and I, I thought it was worth looking because I'm pretty sure Locke was looking at least at Euclid, you know, when he was thinking about this. So, um, um, so uh, these both also have proofs in Euclid. So if Locke is right that proofs are a matter of finding intermediate ideas, and if these really need the proofs that Euclid gives them, then we should, we should think there's intermediate ideas here, too. I suspect, though, that Locke thinks that we know these two intuitively. Um, now, I mean, the proof of 113 is really strange, actually. I mean, it's sort of a matter of definition. Uh, it's, I mean, I think it's only there at all because I think if Euclid could say that the angles add up to a straight angle that is 180 degrees the way we do, then there wouldn't be anything to prove. Because, right, you'd be proving that if two angles share the same side, they share the same if two angles have sides that are part of the same straight line, then they have sides that are part of the same straight line, <laughs> right? The reason there has to be a proof of it is that he doesn't consider this to be an angle. So he has to talk about the sum of two right angles. And so he has to do a little dance to show that, you know, but so, um, but the one that's interesting is the proof of 129. So, because the proof of 129 appeals directly to what's called a parallel postulate. 
And the parallel posture is really interesting because it's what makes Euclidean geometry different from non-Euclidean geometry. <laughs> right? And it's what makes it true, for example, that in Euclidean geometry, you can't take two straight lines and use them to enclose a space. <laughs> um, so, and the, the parallel postulate, the way Euclid states it, is basically um, that, um, if I get this right, that um, if a line makes um, angles with two other lines, these angles, <laughs> such that they add up to two right angles, then these are parallel, and only them, right? So parallel meaning they never meet, right? So of course, a special case of that would be if you have a common perpendicular, then they never meet. These add up to two right angles. But the postulate is stated a little more generally, and it says whenever they add up to two right angles, these two parallels will never meet. And then from that, it's relatively easy to prove the uh, alternating angle theorem in 129. I mean, basically, he says, imagine one of these is bigger than the other. In that case, these would add up to less than 180 degrees, right? Because this would be smaller than, than this. And therefore, these lines would meet, so they weren't parallel after all. So it's a reductio, right? Um, so, and my guess is that Locke doesn't think that that extra dance is necessary. He probably thinks that these angles already could be just compared to each other. Whether that's true or not is not so important, but what is really important is that one way or another, um, this proof relies on an intuition about so there's two things that we have to know in, um, intuitively. Because the demonstrative proof, its steps have to be intuitive, as he says. Right? And there's two things that we have to know intuitively. One is um, that um, um, I have to be able to know intuitively about a particular figure involving two lines that never meet, <laughs> that these angles are the same. And the other is, if this is going to be a, a universal demonstration, I have to know intuitively that that only depends on the fact that these lines will never meet. So it will always be true. <laughs> Whenever I have two lines that never meet, and a line that falls across both of them, that those two angles are equal. Um, and this is, this is exactly how Locke says that mathematical proofs work. Um, he says um, that, um, This is on page 470. This is why the mathematical proof convinces me not only about the particular case to which I'm applying it now, but to the general case, and I can use it forever, but now that I remember it. He remembers, that is, he knows, for remembrance is but the reviving of some past knowledge, that he was once certain of the truth of this proposition, that the three angles of a triangle are equal to two right ones. The immutability of the same relations between the same immutable things is now the idea that shows him that if the three angles of a triangle were once equal to two right ones, they will always be equal to two right ones. So the point is that part of the original intuition had to, and not only the original intuition, but the intuition that's called up again later, has to be the immutability. That these are relations between immutable things. So that what's true of these two lines that never meet has to be true of every two lines that never meet, because it only depends on their meaning. 
Um, and um, 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 basically, that means that we have to have intuitive knowledge of a necessary connection between um, of, between an infinite number of distinct ideas, <laughs> um, which is what is the is the fact that Kant is going to use to show that if there is such a thing as mathematics, you have to believe that we have pure a priori intuition. Okay, um, let me just stop there. <laughs>